All right, I'm now going to introduce Dr. Johnny Keeling. He is the head of the BBC Studios Natural History Unit, so I'm sure we've all enjoyed many of their films. He's also a visiting professor at the University of the West of England in Bristol. He's produced and directed numerous um, wildlife miniseries and documentaries, so including Planet Earth, Dave Nassenborough's Life of Mammals, Mountain Gorillas, and many more. He's also the producer of the 3D giant screen film Antarctica, and he's the executive producer on the BAFTA and Emmy Award winning Seven Worlds and One Planet. Dr. Keeling is going to talk to us now about filmmaking perspectives of human wildlife conflict. And I think it's a really interesting one because it's often how we've often engaged in this, particularly growing up, and involves quite a lot of complexities. So, Johnny? Thanks, Amy. Thank you, John. I was uh, on the train the other day with a friend and they said, what are you doing this week? I said, I'm going to talk at uh, Oxford University and they looked sort of surprised and said, gosh, you know, it's an important talk, big intelligent people. I said, yeah, I'm very nervous. I said, what are you going to talk about? And I said, um, I'm going to say, uh, can wildlife, human wildlife conflict ever be entertaining? And they were a bit surprised and they sort of said, you, you, you can't talk about that. So if I'm being provocative, that's the question I ask. Can human wildlife conflict ever be entertaining? Uh, and I'll see what you think of the answer at the end. But um, by that I mean, you know, how do we reach a mass audience, a diverse audience, with arguably the most important question of our time and the most important story? So I work at the BBC, which exists to educate, inform and entertain. And people have a lot of choice now. There's so many platforms, there's great dramas out there, many channels and films. And so what does that mean for the way that we portray human wildlife con conflict and in our content? So um, I've worked at the BBC for 27 years at the Natural History Unit, I did a PhD before that and so I've worked in the natural world for I think 35 odd years and I've been fortunate, um, well maybe unfortunate enough to witness human wildlife conflict in the, across the planet in many many forms. But today I'm just going to share three examples of how we at the NHU approach human wildlife conflict and how we've tried to meet the challenge of telling those stories in an engaging and an informative way that brings in a, an audience and engages them. Um, but first of all, let me just give you a, a tiny bit of context about the Naturist Unit. Our mission is really simple. It's to inspire people to understand and love the natural world and ultimately want to protect it. And it is that simple. Um, how do we do that? Well, there are more than 500 people now at the Naturist Unit. They're all driven by passion. They're all driven by curiosity and a really, really strong sense of purpose. Many of us are, are scientists um, and we come from a, a conservation background or a scientific background. Um, we're not for profit. Any of the profits we do make go back into the BBC uh, to make more content. And as I speak, there's many teams around the world, all corners of the planet, documenting the natural world and telling stories, something that we've done for, for nearly 70 years now. And we make shows for every age across all platforms. We make them for Apple, Discovery, Netflix, um, Universal, and of course the BBC. But really importantly, and this is what people don't understand, people write to me and say, why don't you commission more programs about human wildlife conflict? We don't commission the programs, we are a studio, so we pitch ideas, we try to persuade um, our clients where possible to pay for those, those programs, and we try to engage the audience and excite the audience to watch, watch our stories. Um, the types of shows we make, podcasts, children's shows, live TV like Spring Watch, giant screen films, presenter-led expeditions, feature documentaries, I'll show you one of those today, uh, and some of the ambitious landmark series like Planet Earth and Blue Planet. And those ones are watched in most countries around the world, um, and they typically reach somewhere around a billion people. So we feel that responsibility massively, I certainly do. Um, and human wildlife conflict does appear in many of those programs in many different forms. Um, we also have a social media uh, impact campaign group. That, uh, so in 2017, after Blue Planet 2, we produced something called Our Blue Planet. And off the back of that, um, that again reached about a billion people. And it helped to motivate the audience to, to change their behavior around single-use plastics. So there was sort of, I think there was a, a groundswell of movement anyway to that point, but it just sort of tipped the balance. And in 2017, lots of people changed their behavior. So, as I say, that they can be quite powerful, um, powerful subjects and powerfully presented. But what about human wildlife conflict specifically? Well, let's go to the case studies. The very first of these is um, 
about a film called The Rise and Fall of the Marsh Pride, and it came out in 2022. I don't know if anyone, has anyone seen that here? Not many people. Um, well, you will all see it now, you'll all see a bit of it anyway. And it featured a famous pride of lions in Kenya called The Marsh Pride, who'd been filmed for about 40 years. Um, it was a 90 minute documentary and it told an incredible story of that lion dynasty and on one level it was all about animal behaviour, about drama and animal family but also it wove in interviews with people associated with the Marsh Pride so it had some guides, camera crews, Maasai herdsmen and Mara Predator Conservation Programme uh, employees and it, it showcased some of the challenges faced by lions and people in Kenya so if we could, oh I can play the first clip Let's see if this works. So that was about the direct conflict between um, cattle herders and lions. And then there was also, uh, in the 90 minute film, a piece about poisoning, which I'll show you. So it's a film which features hunting and poisoning and potential solutions as well. I've just shown you a short, two short clips of a 90 minute film. Um, but I think the initial um, attraction for the audience is that they're drawn in through emotional characters and with the animal drama. Um, and just as a sort of side note really, um, actually a really important one, um, we have got screenings of that film that's going around um, both at a national level and at a community level, local level, um, within the Mara. So we're working with a local charity who are screening the film to, to people around, around the park and around that community. Um, we have something called Project Songbird, which launched last year. Um, it's an initiative that's a million pounds for the next three years for in-country training, to train local filmmakers to tell their own stories and also to... Um, to have screenings and scholarships as well. So we've got scholarships at the University of West of England where we're paying, actually this year it's two Kenyan students will come and be fully paid for for the next few years to do a master's at, at UWE. Um, so that's one way of telling the story, basically, is to, is to sort of, what I would say is sort of on the nose. And then um, I'd like to now show you a second bit of program, which is from Seven Worlds, One Planet. It's a David Attenborough series. It was about animal behavior. And there was uh, about... 15 million people in the UK have watched it and hundreds of millions around the world. It was broadcast, just for, again for context, 7pm on a Sunday night in the UK. And each, each episode was a, about a single continent and each episode featured the unique animals of that continent and the challenges they faced. And as a production team, we wanted to include within those challenges the conservation issues and the human-wildlife conflict. Um, but we wanted to make sure that was really carefully embedded. If you imagine people are sitting down on a Sunday night, we're in their living rooms, they're watching nice animal behavior. Do you then suddenly just hit them with um, a deforestation, say, or habitat loss? Or do you gently weave it in? So I'm gonna show this clip from the Asia episode, which I hope you can see we've tried really, really hard to, um, to sort of embed it carefully and gently bring the audience along and not suddenly turn people off. If we, oh, I keep thinking about, I'm gonna play the clip, not them. There we go. We, we also wanted to give people solutions as well and inspire hope because that wasn't particularly hopeful. But you can see how we, how we, how we got to that point. You know, we sat in the, in the office thinking, we want to tell a story about, climate, about, um, about deforestation. How do we do that? And how do we do it with a way that's really intriguing? And so that was, you know, there was a lot of thought went into that. And then the, the next clip I'm going to show, so normally at the end of these films, we have a 10 minute behind the scenes making of, which is how do we do it? And we again thought, we can't just leave people with that. How can we um, give people some solutions and inspire them around what they could do and you know, activate change? So uh, if, we can, if I can play the next clip, actually. Um, it, this, is, this, this was the 10 minute piece at the end. I'm just gonna show a short piece of it. And it's about um, palm oil and, and why some of the forests have been disappearing. So we're walking a very kind of careful line there about trying to shame people or tell them what to do, just giving them you know, the, the facts, trying to do a very complicated subject in just a few minutes um, for a big audience. Um, the final clip I want to play um, is one that I really love because um, we wanted to tell a, 
a story about um, over-exploitation and about the story of whaling. And it, this was in a present tense documentary. Again, it's Seven Worlds, One Planet. It's in the Antarctic episode. Um, but it's a historic story, trying to tell it in a present tense, trying to tell a story that's positive um, about how we can uh, make a change if we all come together as a, as a community of nations. And we thought, again, really long and hard about how to do that. And we wanted to make it seamless and emotionally impactful. And what I love about it is you'll notice the first few minutes of it don't feature a single animal whatsoever. Um, and, and, then it, and then it turns. But um, it, I, again, I wasn't sure what the commission and what our clients were going to say once we, we showed them this. And they might say, well, this is a wildlife documentary. Why are you, why are you showing us old buildings? Because that is all it really is. Um, but, I'll just play you the clip and uh, see what you think. So just to summarize then, um, as TV producers and media makers, we face a really huge challenge to make human-wildlife conflict engaging and compelling to bring people to the films and to the subject matter. And in facing that challenge, we walk, I think, a really difficult line between educating and informing and also entertaining people, persuading and pleasing our clients who basically have the money and make the decisions. And we work really hard to try and strike that balance in all that we do. Um, I mean, I believe we have a responsibility to, to reflect those pressing stories. Like I said, I think it's the most important story of our time. And to persuade other people that it's an important story and worth investing a few hours in as they watch uh, content. So we're, we're invited, like I said, into people's lounges on a, on a Sunday evening, certainly in the UK, or we go out to communities and show people give up their time and we show them the films. We have a duty to tell those stories in a really responsible way, not through despair and disaster, but I think more through, without being over-optimistic though, through hope and inspiration. Thanks very much. Hi there. I don't know if I've dropped my mic. Um, that was amazing, really good. Um, yeah, and so powerful, I think, to see just that incredible imagery. It just shows how effective I think films are at getting those messages across. Let's have one question for Johnny now, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time after David's talk and we can see if there's any additional questions. Somebody straight with a question at the back there. Yep. Okay, yep. Thank you for the awesome uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Betty and I'm a researcher. Now, I believe that the media is actually at the center of, uh, your work must be difficult, if I may say so, because you have to balance what you tell. Who, as you said, you are invited into coffee dates and people's desks and people's lunches. But how do you balance between reporting the truth no matter how hard it is or how graphic it can be, and actually uh, meeting the expectations of the funder. As John Kamanga said earlier, let's report what is the truth. People are living with wildlife. But then again, we have to create a gap in research for us to get the money to go and do the job we need to do. So how do you balance that? Okay, so a big question there about balancing truth and the, re the realities in the field and, as you said, the entertainment and the needs for funding, lots of different things there, lots of competing audiences you've got to deal with. First of all, I'd say it is true. I mean, everything we said in, that, in those documentaries is true, so that's not a difficult thing to do. But maybe is it, you are saying, how, what do we tell? Which stories do we tell? Which ones do we choose? Because there's lots of different stories. Um, I mean, I would say... We look at that as a, as a group, and on the Seven Worlds, One Planet team, there were uh, about 25 people, but the key decision makers, there's about six of us, and I'd say five of those, five of us, all had PhDs in, in wildlife biology, some educated here, um, you know, and did PhDs here, and, and it's just trying to look at those stories and say, what represents, um, so on, on Antarctica, we're saying, what represents a good Antarctic story that's visual, is important to tell, um, and in terms of the Asia story, we thought we would want to talk about deforestation. I have actually got a clip, but I won't show it, of, of Europe as well and the loss of habitat in Europe. So we sort of looked at each place and said we can sort of do one or two stories. Which ones do we think are visual and interesting? And that's how we balanced it. Certainly they're all true. 
but you know, we make those decisions and then we go to our commissioners and clients and say, we think this is really interesting and you've got to believe us and usually they do. Yeah. Great. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Thanks so much, Johnny. Really exciting. I know there are more. I can see loads of hands up, but let's see if there's time for a couple more at the end. But otherwise, thank you very thank much. You very that much. was amazing.